What's up guys, Mikey here. Christmas is among us. The time of year all about presents, decorations, and getting together to celebrate with the people you love the most. It's also about finding the Krabby Patty secret formula to send to Plankton to get Plankton's holiday hits. I've been scouring Amazon for it, and I will find it one of these days. But if I find it and get scammed, oh boy. The holidays are an awesome time of year with snow, presents, and the lights all around town, and something that gets everybody in the mood for the holidays are the Christmas songs that play on the radio. There are some awesome holiday songs, and everybody has their favorite, but who better to get people hyped up with holiday songs than an anemone? Back in the early to mid-2000s, starting in 2002 during the Christmas season, there were these shorts on Nickelodeon called Merry Nickmas. They were shorts that were Nickelodeon's way of celebrating the holidays. These shorts lasted roughly 30 to 60 seconds and only aired during December. Of course they do, otherwise it wouldn't be Christmas shorts. These were little mini crossovers between all the Nickelodeon cartoon characters at the time. They debuted in December 2002 and had so much charm to them. I have a soft spot for these, and I and countless others remember them so fondly, it's just so sad that Nickelodeon doesn't do this kind of thing anymore, especially considering the cartoons that are on the network these days. Of course you could argue it's because most of the cartoons featuring these characters they used in these shorts aren't airing on the network anymore, not even in reruns, but Nickelodeon still owns these characters and can bring them back if they want to. And there's talk about reboots on the network, so why not try some of these with cartoons like Rocket Power or the Wild Thornberries? But I'm getting off topic. The shorts were cool because they parodied a bunch of regular Christmas media like The Grinch and Frosty the Snowman, but had Nickelodeon characters in these places. Some featured stop motion animation, which is a callback to stuff like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. These were also a way to promote the Christmas specials for these cartoons when December would roll around, and they were just fun to watch all around. There are a handful of these shorts, and I could talk about them all right now, but I feel like just talking about this short in particular, and I'm sure you know what it is. Plankton's Holiday Hits is a parody of all those commercials that advertise Christmas albums. The fact that this stars Plankton automatically gives this short actual purpose and integrity. I remember watching all these shorts back in the day as a kid, but I'm not sure if Plankton's Holiday Hits was the short that came on the least. I do remember this was the short I wanted to see the most, so it probably did come on the least, but that didn't stop me from watching it whenever it came on. This short has Plankton singing parodies of classic Christmas songs, but with his own evil twist, as you'd expect. The short started up talking about how Plankton had smash hit albums in the past. His first album, Born a Chum, Rock the Country, and his next album, Krabby Road, instantly put him at number one on the charts. Who knew Plankton was so talented at singing? It almost doesn't surprise me. Plankton has been shown singing on a few occasions, and those are usually pretty popular among fans. If he tried to make a career around that, he'd probably be more successful than if he actually managed to steal the formula. And now, Sheldon J. Plankton is back with a collection of holiday hits, which is where the word parody comes into play. The songs he sings are Come All Ye Faithful, Joy to the World, Deck the Halls, and The Nutcracker Suite, or as he calls them, Come All Ye Fearful, I'll Rule the World, Deck the Halls, and The Nutcracker Suite. After the last song, it stated that in order to obtain this album, we would have to send the secret recipe for the Krabby Patty to Plankton at the Chum Bucket located in Bikini Bottom, USA. Wait, I thought Bikini Bottom was located at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Does that mean that the Pacific Ocean is property of the United States? Maybe it's true. The commercial ends with Plankton wishing a season's beating to us underlings. That's another reason why I'm trying to get that album. I'm tired of Plankton always calling me an underling every year. <gasps> and I think I just found something. 
Out of all these songs, The Nutcracker is the least altered because since it's well known for being an instrumental, Plankton is just singing to the rhythm, which is what people would do if it's a song like that, or just hum the melody. Out of all the four songs in this CD, I always enjoyed listening to I'll Rule the World and Deck the Halls the most, but I can't really choose which one of them is my favorite. I love the melody of I'll Rule the World and the part where Plankton laughs in the place of the fa la la la, -la from Deck the Halls. The rhythm of Deck the Halls is good too, but Plankton going ha 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 ha, I just liked more. Of course, I do like the whole short, but those two songs I loved hearing the most. This may be a stretch, but this short might have also inspired some future Spongebob productions as well. There is an episode from season 6 that kinda references this short. Episode 198, Krabby Road, is about Plankton forming a band with Spongebob and another plan to steal the Krabby Patty formula. Both this episode title and the title of Plankton's second album are a reference to everybody's favorite album by the Beatles, Abbey Road. The episode is about music, and the title is possibly indirectly taken from this short, which is also about music. I remember the first time I saw this episode as a kid. When I saw the title, I thought it was familiar, and soon enough, I remembered it came from this short. The Born a Chum album is a reference to Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen, but that has nothing to do with the actual show, but I thought I'd just bring it up anyway since it's still a part of the commercial. I found the formula! The glass bottle broke during transit, so I'm going to use this water bottle to send it to Plankton. If you're wondering why I didn't just have it sent straight there, I have to make sure it's real before I send it to him. Yep, it's real. And if you're wondering how I know it's real, shut up. I'm probably not the first person to say this, but if this was available to the general public, it would fly off the shelves, especially in the 2000s. The fact that this commercial doesn't have a phone number to call is probably so that kids can't call it to order it, let alone without their parents' permission. Also, the fact it's only four short songs makes it feel like the most redundant CD to make and publish in real life. If anything, it would have been awesome if these songs, whether all mashed into one or extended with more lyrics, were included on something like the SpongeBob The Best Day Ever CD or the SpongeBob SquarePants The Yellow Album. Or even if this, along with all the other Mary Nickmas shorts, were included as part of the special features on something like the SpongeBob Christmas DVD from 2003 or even the SpongeBob Season 2 DVD. Without YouTube, these would have been lost with time. In conclusion, this short is pretty cool and it might just possibly be my favorite out of the Mary Nickmas shorts. Of course I love all of them, and I think the huge crossover specials like the 12 Days of Nickmas and Nickmas Holiday Party are awesome because it's great seeing all these classic Nicktoons characters together in stop motion animation, but sometimes the most simple shorts can be the most enjoyable, and this is proof. Of course, this is the only short that has Spongebob characters and only Spongebob characters, so it might be a bit of my bias, but I still love the other shorts seeing the Spongebob characters with the other Nicktoons. I'll probably talk about those at some point in the future, but it's most likely my desire to watch this short in particular stick out in my mind more than most others. Regardless the reason, it'll always have a place in my heart. After that long talk about Plankton's holiday hits, it finally came in the mail today! I can't believe I actually have it after wanting it for so long as a kid. It looks just like I thought it would. Now for the moment of truth. Time to actually listen to it. I listened to it and it turns out whoever sent me this pranked me so hard. This isn't Plankton's holiday hits. This is worthless! <gasps> I've been scammed! Since I've been scammed, I don't care to know what this is. But I will say what it is. Not Plankton's holiday hits, that's for sure. $100 wasted on the secret formula I sent to Plankton. Well, since I've been scammed, there's only one thing to do now. Later. That's what you get for scamming me!
I did it. I saved Christmas. Hey, what's up guys? Mikey here. It's that time of year again. December. And that means winter is coming. A close second to Christmas. The best time of year because of Santa Claus breaking and entering and leaving presents for everybody. But winter lasts through the end of December and into January. And you can't have winter without snow! The holiday season is here and it's time to be excited. Everybody says their year has been mediocre, but the Christmas season instantly puts everybody in a good mood. Everything about this time of year is just pure joy, and while everybody does things like decorating and listening to Christmas music, everybody always has some kind of thing that's just special to them during the holidays. For me personally, I always love seeing the first snowfall of the year. I just thought the snow looked beautiful, and I loved playing in snow as a kid. Also, there was a chance for snow days to occur. That doesn't happen in the summer. But unfortunately, in my neck of the woods, I hate to admit this, but I don't get a lot of white Christmases. I have had a few, don't get me wrong, but most of the time, if it does snow, it would just rain almost every Christmas Eve and the snow would be gone. And it's a true shame because everybody knows you can't spell Christmas without W-H-I-T-E. So for me, if I saw snow on Christmas morning, it just felt that much more special. Yeah, that's why I love snow so much. But since it looks like I might not get a white Christmas this year, I might as well talk about something else to get my mind off of it. Christmas is approaching fast, and I don't have much time, so you know what that means. It's time to talk about Merry Nickmas again. For those who are unfamiliar, Merry Nickmas was a series of 30 to 60 second shorts that Nickelodeon would run during commercial breaks in December. They were mini crossovers between the characters of classic Nickelodeon cartoons like the Rugrats, Rocket Power, the Wild Thornberries, Jimmy Neutron, Spongebob, and the Fairly Odd Parents, just to name a few. These were always done as a way to advertise premieres or reruns of these shows Christmas specials. They were shown to the public for the first time in December 2002 and were just so charming to watch. No matter how many times I say it, looking back at the good old days makes this decade seem like everybody likes the bad stuff these days. That aren't video games, of course. Last time, we took a look at Plankton's holiday hits. This short was about Plankton singing parodies of classic Christmas songs, and this in itself was a parody of real-life artists promoting their own real-life Christmas albums. That was the only short that had Spongebob characters, but my favorite part of that short was Plankton singing. This time, we'll be talking about Patrick the Snowman. This short features more than just Spongebob characters. It also features Nigel Thornberry from the Wild Thornberries and Jimmy and Carl Sheen, Cindy, Libby, and Goddard from the Adventures of Jimmy Neutron, Boy Genius. This short is an obvious parody of Frosty the Snowman, the Christmas specials where a snowman comes alive after a hat is placed on its head. There were a few more specials about this, as well as multiple songs from several artists based on this special. Obviously, I knew about Frosty the Snowman as a kid way before I saw this short on TV for the first time. As for Plankton's holiday hits, I never saw any advertisement for Christmas albums on TV in real life. After I was scanned last Christmas, I think I'll be sticking to listening to Christmas music on the radio and maybe my phone from now on. That way I won't get scammed. As for Patrick the Snowman, not only do I remember seeing this as a kid, this was the short I remember seeing the most on TV. Out of all six Merry Nickmas shorts, Patrick the Snowman was the short that I recall being on TV the most, so I'd argue I have more memories from that short than most others. Unlike Plankton's Holiday Hits, this short has two different versions. There was a short version that was 30 seconds long, and a longer version that lasted 90 seconds. Unfortunately, the version of those two that was on TV more often was the short 30 second version. That was always disappointing because almost nothing happens in the short version aside from Jimmy and his friends bringing Patrick to life. But in order to explain the differences between the two versions, we have to go through them both and explain why the short version was not nearly as fun to watch as the long version. And let's get the short version out of the way first. The short started up with Nigel Thornberry narrating this tale of the first winter arriving early this year. Jimmy and his friends build a snowman that looks just like Patrick Starr. Jimmy puts on his newest invention, the Spoofinator 4000, which brings Patrick to life. The kids are surprised by Patrick coming to life, they chase him down, and that's it. 
That's how I react whenever I see the short version. The short version was only 30 seconds long, and it ends by cutting out most of the story the short is supposed to have. Now for the longer version. It starts out the same way as the short version. After Patrick is brought to life, this time the kids cheer and start to have fun with him. However, Patrick started to overstay his welcome after a minute. As he always does. The end of winter was a long way away, so they had to come up with a way to get rid of him. Jimmy planned on creating a wormhole to propel him into the distant future. Cindy suggested melting him, but the others didn't agree. I don't know if that would have worked. I've never seen a starfish melt before. They decided to send him into the future. 70 years later, the kids were in the Retroville Retirement Community Home where they encountered Patrick again. Patrick then pokes Nigel Thornberry, who is now a skeleton, and that was the end of the short. See? I told you the short version was bad. The longer version was so much more entertaining to watch. Personally, I never understood why the shorter version had to exist. There was nothing particularly memorable about it compared to the 90 second version. I don't know about you, but I never knew anybody who actually liked the 30 second version more than the 90 second one. So I think it's obvious that nobody saw the short version and said, YES! The bad version of Patrick the Snowman! The longer version had more going on, and Patrick annoying the Jimmy Neutron characters was funny. I really liked the part where Patrick was saying poke, 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 while poking Carl with a stick. I always thought it was funny and that was one of the biggest reasons why I always wanted to see the long version and never really liked the short version. Besides, since Patrick wore Libby's dress and poked Nigel Thornberry's skeleton just goes to show that the shorter version was unnecessary. Whenever watching either of the shorts, you can't tell which version is playing until after Patrick is brought to life. If it's the long version, not only are the Jimmy Neutron characters happy at this point, but so am I. If it's the short version, it's a shot of Cindy, and the kids scream and chase after Patrick. Patrick's face right here pretty much describes me whenever I find out the version I was watching was the short version. However, I did recently discover the critical difference between the long and short versions that come up at the beginning. At the start of the good version, Nigel Thornberry slips and falls in the snow, while in the bad version, he doesn't. Apparently, that's the way to denote the long and short versions at the very beginning. And I do not know how I did not notice that as a child. And since the short version ends almost immediately after Patrick is brought to life, why would Nickelodeon even bother making two different versions of this short? It would really be better if they made one or the other. And the version they should have made obviously should have been the 90 second version. Even if it was the short that came on the least out of all six of these shorts, it would have made every time that short came on that much better. You'd go in expecting a 90 second clip every time and get it. Every time. If they only made the short version, it would probably be everybody's least favorite Mary Nickmas short, myself included. Also, I don't know why, but the shot of Sheen shivering was always lodged in the back of my brain and would always pop into my brain whenever I think about the Mary Nickmas shorts throughout elementary school. Also, fun fact, Bill Fagerbakke, the voice of Patrick Starr, would later voice Frosty the Snowman in the 2004 direct-to-video movie, The Legend of Frosty the Snowman. Additionally, after re-watching this online recently, I discovered that Patrick said, Birthday Happy, after he's brought to life. Birthday Happy! Every time I saw this growing up, I thought Patrick said, Birthday Hug, whenever he's brought to life. I'm honestly surprised that he was saying something different than what I thought he actually said. Did anybody else think he said birthday hug when they watched this as a kid? Anybody out there? No. Just me? Okay. Even though I discovered he said something else than what I thought he said as a kid, that doesn't take away the fact that this is still a really good short. I didn't like that the 30 second version appeared more often than the good version. You can bet that I was happy whenever the 90 second version came on. You could argue that the short version makes the good version that much more special whenever it comes on, but for me, I often just go in hoping to see the 90 second version, but then the bad version comes on and would crush my hopes and dreams. It would eventually get to a point where I would expect the bad version, and then the good version comes on. Then the next time this short is shown, I would get the 30 second version and the cycle repeats. I will always love the long version because I like seeing Patrick interacting with the Jimmy Neutron characters and the funny ending where Jimmy and his friends are old and meet Patrick again. While the CGI in this short can look a little cheap, I think that oddly gives it its own charm. 
It's hard to describe, but I do think it's a neat quirk and does kind of make it stand out compared to most, if not all, of the other shorts. It may not be as big a crossover short as something like The 12 Days of Nickmas, but that's not a bad thing. It's another thing that makes this as good as it is. Not everything needs to be a massive crossover like The 12 Days of Nickmas, and not everything has to be just one character from one show like Plankton's Holiday Hits. There's not a whole lot else to this short, but I think that's okay. I really like it because I like Jimmy Neutron and Patrick Starr, and it's cool seeing these characters interact. Even though I hated when the bad version would come on instead of the good version, that doesn't take anything away from how much I always enjoyed watching the good version. It's cute and charming, and I love all the characters in this. I don't think I'd say it's my absolute favorite of the Merry Nickmas shorts, especially since they're all good. But I still have some great memories, and it will always be charming to watch again. The good version, that is. Well, that was a nice talk. I like Spongebob characters and Jimmy Neutron characters, so that was a good short. And we're closer to Christmas now, too, so I'm gonna go outside and see if there's any snow now. Nope. Still no snow. That's upsetting. But things could always be worse. I could be stuck not watching the Spongebob Christmas specials or any of my favorite Christmas movies, and that would just be horrid. But since Nickelodeon doesn't show the Merry Nickmas shorts anymore, I don't have to worry about getting stuck with something I don't want. Except if I buy a pair of earbuds where the headphone cord will not fit in the headphone jack of my current iPhone. Hey what's up guys, Mikey here. If it wasn't obvious, it's that time of year again. Not only are the holidays such a joy-filled time of year, but it's fun to look back on how mediocre the year was and how much fun previous Christmases were. But I'm in my mid-twenties now, so I want to take a look back at my very first Christmas ever. One hour later. I was less than one year old when I had my first Christmas, so I don't remember much of it. So I'm going to do the next best thing and remember the other first Christmas ever. Holiday specials, the one surefire way to get pumped up for any holiday of the year. As of this point in the series, Spongebob has had three holiday specials. Episode 26, Scaredy Pants from Season 1, which was a Halloween episode. Episode 32, Valentine's Day, which was a Valentine's Day episode. And even an April Fool's Day episode. Episode 38, Fools in April. But there is one important holiday that we have yet to talk about with Spongebob. Easter. Even after all these years, we still have no Spongebob Easter special. But we're not here to talk about the day Jesus Christ rose, we're here to talk about the day he was born. Christmas Who is the episode where Spongebob learns about the holiday of Christmas and wants to bring it to the city of Bikini Bottom, much to Squidward's dismay. This episode aired on December 6, 2000 and is the first of many things for the series. It's the first 22 minute episode of the series, the first Christmas themed episode of the series, the first appearance of Patchy the Pirate and Potty the Parrot, the first episode to have an alternate theme song, and of course, the first episode with a question mark in the title. For almost every episode that aired up to this point, they have been 11 minutes long and two of those episodes take up a half hour time slot, whereas this episode is roughly twice the length of a normal episode and this would be the only episode airing during that half hour time slot. And these kinds of episodes would show up almost every season for the rest of the series. Patchy the Pirate and Potty the Parrot are some of the most notable secondary characters and they would only show up during some of the 22 minute episodes, the hour long TV movies, and a couple other occasions. Patchy the Pirate and Potty the Parrot make their debut appearances in this episode. Patchy the Pirate is played by Tom Kenny, the voice of Spongebob and Gary, and Potty the Parrot is a pair of string puppet who, in seasons 2 and 3, is voiced by Spongebob creator Steven Hillenburg. Patchy is a stereotypical pirate and is the self-proclaimed president of the Spongebob Squarepants fan club as he claims he is Spongebob's biggest fan. What? Potty is a sassy parrot sidekick of Patchy. Despite being a live action portion of the episode, these segments also feel very cartoony. The Patchy segments were created because Steven Hillenberg and the crew thought about how they can make an episode 22 minutes long. Patchy the Pirate was made as an homage to children's TV hosts from low budget local access channels and... Merry Christmas! That's right, Potty! It is Christmas! You can tell they were catered to children. The Patchy segments take place in Encino, California and they would relate to whatever the actual Spongebob portion of the episode would be about. 
In this case, the Patchy segments are about getting ready for Christmas, and Patchy talks about the first Christmas ever celebrated in Bikini Bottom. The Patchy segments don't really add anything to the cartoon as a whole, and are more considered a separate portion of the episode altogether. Patchy does show up less and less as the series goes on, but he does appear in every 22 minute episode in seasons 2 and 3. As for this being the first Christmas episode in the series, there are only three official Christmas specials in the show as of 2022. This episode, episode 335, It's a Spongebob Christmas from season 8, and episode 518, Spongebob's Road to Christmas from season 13. Nickelodeon counts episode 453, Goons on the Moon from season 11 as a Christmas episode because Santa appears in the final third of the episode, and that's how they advertised it, but I don't think of it as a Christmas special. For the theme song in this episode, Painty the Pirate has a wreath on him, and the song is sung by a ladies chorus as opposed to Painty the Pirate and the children that usually sing it, and this image appears at the end of the theme song. As for the question mark in this episode's title card, Christmas who? Yup. As this is the first Christmas episode and the first of everything else I just mentioned, it must have a lot to live up to. So let's watch this episode and see how well it holds up. So the first thing we see is Penny the Pirate with a wreath signifying it's a Christmas episode. A ladies chorus sings the theme song, this image appears, and then the French narrator introduces us to the president of Spongebob's fan club, Patchy the Pirate. Patchy was getting ready for Christmas when he hits himself in the eye with his hook. That's why it always helps to have an eye patch on standby. His parrot Potty appears and says Merry Christmas. Patchy then shows what Spongebob and Patrick are doing to get ready for Santa Claus. Patchy is making cookie dough, which Potty wants to eat, but Patchy was refusing to let him. Then a bell rings three times and Patchy decided to open fan mail. After getting into a fight with Potty, Patchy reads a letter from a 10 year old and says that Christmas wasn't always celebrated in Bikini Bottom. Potty eats Patchy's cookie dough, and Patchy started to tell the story of Spongebob's very first Christmas. The Spongebob portion of the episode starts up, and Spongebob plans on sneaking up on Sandy to show her a karate move. Sandy plugs in some Christmas lights, and Spongebob thinks there's a fire, and he tries to save her. He finds out there was no fire, and Sandy was surprised that Spongebob doesn't know about Christmas. She tells him more about the holiday, and the next day, at the Krusty Krab, Spongebob says, And everyone pretends to like the fruitcake! Wrong, sir! My dad liked fruitcake, and he never lied to me! Spongebob was telling Patrick, Squidward, and Mr. Krabs about Christmas, and how you can write a letter to Santa Claus, and tell him what you want, and he'll bring it to you on Christmas Eve. Mr. Krabs was excited, and so was Patrick, but of course, Squidward didn't seem remotely interested at all. Patrick ripped his paper, and Spongebob showed him how to write a letter. Later that day, Spongebob showed off his new mechanism that can shoot bottles to the surface so they can get to Santa. That's not the North Pole! Mr. Krabs gave Spongebob his letter, so did Patrick, as well as other citizens of Bikini Bottom. Squidward is still furious about everybody believing in Santa Claus because he doesn't. After everybody else sent their letters to the surface, they start to get ready for Christmas and Spongebob and Patrick sing a song getting so into the spirit. Everybody around town is getting ready, and even Squidward's house is decorated, which Squidward doesn't like. Everybody was excited for Christmas, but after the song, Squidward closes blinds. It cuts back to Patchy, and it goes to a commercial break. Break time! One break later. Okay, back to the show. The show resumes, and Patchy continues telling the story. Spongebob sends the last letters and realizes Squidward hasn't written one yet. He runs to Squidward's house, but Squidward refuses to write a letter and continues to retaliate that he doesn't believe in Santa. And he says that by writing a letter, he'll lose the following. My self-respect, my sanity, my lunch. But he didn't say he would lose his integrity, so therefore, I would still write a letter. Everybody else in town wants Squidward to join in on the fun, but Squidward refuses to budge. Everybody else stays up all night, singing and waiting for Santa Claus, but by morning, he doesn't come. They all get mad at Spongebob and leave. Spongebob and Patrick thinks he's running late by stopping for something to eat because fat guys get hungry. Patrick's living proof of that. More time goes by and Santa still doesn't show up and Patrick leaves, disappointed. And so does a Sandman. Squidward wakes up and starts teasing Spongebob. He takes a picture of him and starts teasing him about Christmas. Spongebob started to get sad, but he gave Squidward a present because he didn't want Squidward to feel left out on the celebration. Squidward opens a present and finds out that it's a clarinet made out of driftwood and can play Dance of the Sugar Plums. 
Squidward was absolutely touched by the present, but also feels like a donkey because of how he treated Spongebob just because he was trying to spread a little joy. Spongebob started to take the decorations down when Squidward showed up dressed as Santa Claus. Squidward fell off the roof and Spongebob was in absolute shock to see Santa, and fainted, not realizing it was Squidward. Man, I wish I could have acted like that when my parents took me to see Santa when I was young. Spongebob was so happy to see Santa, but asked a few questions about his image and Squidward came up with excuses for them. Spongebob thanked Santa for bringing Christmas to Bikini Bottom and Squidward said Spongebob did that. And Spongebob was so overjoyed, he fainted and Gary took him home. Then a little girl shows up asking for a present. Squidward went inside and came back out giving the girl a wrench. Why not a hammer? Then more townspeople showed up asking for presents, and Squidward ran back into his house, coming out giving more and more of his own belongings for the town. By the time it was all over, Squidward had given away everything just to make Spongebob happy. Then Spongebob showed up telling Squidward about Santa arriving. Squidward shooed him away and discovered a note at the door, and this note was from the real Santa Claus thanking him for help. He then sees the real Santa flying in the sky. Squidward says he's insane and goes inside with his new clarinet, and Santa flies away, and the Spongebob segment of the episode ends. It cuts back to Patchy the Pirate, who's playing with a homemade Spongebob and Patrick on a boat, which he wears as a hat. He takes off the hat and finds Potty left him a present in the form of Yoshi eggs. I wouldn't eat those. Patchy stands under the mistletoe, and Potty tries to kiss him. The French narrator says goodnight and happy holidays to the audience, and the entire episode ends. So that was Christmas Who, and there is quite a lot to say about this episode. First, let's get this out of the way. The Patchy segments. I do think this is a good introduction to what Patchy and Potty are all about, but looking back in retrospect, I wish it wasn't so obvious that these were catered to children. Obviously, the whole Spongebob series is a kid's show, but the thing is, these segments would be more appealing to all ages, like the rest of the show, if these scenes weren't so apparent that they were for children. I don't have a problem with these segments being low budget, not at all, because having Potty be a parrot puppet gives these segments a certain level of charm you wouldn't see if Potty was done with CGI or by training a real life bird. It's also a shame because one of my all time favorite gags in the show was from these Patchy segments, and that is when Patchy grabs Potty and the puppeteer falls from the ceiling. It's so funny and makes me laugh every time. The name and address withheld is also funny to me, and I absolutely love all the banter between Patchy and Potty. I think the banter is what makes these segments for everybody, and Tom Kenny does an amazing job playing Patchy. These segments are kind of skippable though, and don't really add anything to the cartoon. And that would be fine if Patchy didn't feel like he was talking down to kids sometimes. I know that's what the crew was going for with these segments, and for that, I commend them. But in my opinion, they would be a little better for everybody if they didn't feel like they were so catered to children. If it wasn't for the charm of the potty string puppet, the hilarious banter between him and Patchy, and some good gags every so often, there would be nothing memorable about these segments. Now with that out of the way, let's talk about the Spongebob part of the episode. I love so much about this part of the special. I love how Patrick keeps ripping his paper and uses a ripped up piece of paper for his letter for Santa, and how he keeps saying Santa's actions are like a genie. Just like a genie? Well, he's not wrong. It's so great seeing all the characters in Bikini Bottom in the Christmas spirit. I like how Spongebob immediately tries to save Sandy when he thinks there's a fire, and how fed up with Spongebob she looks when he gets her wet. The actions Sandy does when talking about Christmas are funny. However, this is something I always found kind of off. After Sandy tells Spongebob about Christmas, she just doesn't appear at all throughout the rest of the episode, not even in the second half, and I never understood that. Since she's the only one in Bikini Bottom who knew about Christmas at this point in time, you'd think she would show up at least once to reinforce what Spongebob is saying about Christmas. I guess maybe she doesn't show up because Spongebob would be the one to get blamed for when Santa doesn't show up, so Squidward would make it up to him, but I'm not sure. It is kind of nitpicking, so whatever. Speaking of Squidward, he is astounding in this episode. He starts off being a Scrooge and not wanting to get in the Christmas spirit and saying Santa doesn't exist. When it seems he's right, he rubs it in Spongebob's face, and then he's so happy by the gifts Spongebob gives him, he feels instant remorse for what he's done, and tries to make it up to Spongebob. And while he does accomplish that, he gives away all his stuff as karma, and gets a note from the real Santa saying he's done a good job. 
I love Squidward so much in this episode. I remember once my dad said he kind of didn't like Squidward because he was a little too nice here, but that's the point. It's the holidays, and he's had a change of heart after getting a present from Spongebob. He's supposed to have a turnaround, Dad! That's basically the other point of this episode, and a lot of other Christmas specials. And that's a good segue to our next point of interest, the episode's premise. Something I always loved was how this episode, and the other official Spongebob Christmas specials for that matter, never felt like they were parodying anything. They always felt like their own thing, and that's awesome. And considering the setting of the show, it makes a lot of sense for this episode to be about introducing Christmas to Bikini Bottom. Santa Claus can't breathe underwater, and Sandy, the only land creature, is the only character who knows about Christmas at this point. She tells Spongebob, the main protagonist, about Christmas. Spongebob then tells everybody else in town, and everybody else is excited except Squidward. After things don't quite go as planned, Squidward teases Spongebob and then makes up for his errors after getting a beautiful present from Spongebob. And since Christmas is new to Bikini Bottom in this episode, everything else also makes sense. Since Santa only comes when people are sleeping, that's why he didn't come to Bikini Bottom, because everybody was awake except Squidward. And because they were new to Christmas, this was probably something that Spongebob either forgot about, that Sandy never actually explained to him, or was just too excited to sleep and wanted to stay awake to meet Santa. Because it's Spongebob, why wouldn't he want to meet Santa on his first visit to Bikini Bottom? And with Christmas being well established in this episode, it appears or is mentioned a few times in the series in the future. Santa Claus is also really funny by just how he's constantly laughing in this episode, and of course, we can't forget the song. The song in this episode is amazing. It's so catchy and all the sequences are beautifully animated. It flows so well and it's fun seeing everybody get in the spirit by singing the song. And the high notes Mr. Krabs sings at the end are hilarious. This has always been one of my go-to Christmas songs whenever the holiday season comes around. Sometimes I'd pop this episode in the DVD player just to listen to the song. This song is better than new songs coming out in the 2020s. Have you ever heard new songs coming out in 2022? I have, and thank god my grandpa hasn't. Last but not least, let's go over some fun facts about this episode. When Patchy is playing with the boat and talks about Christmas Island, Ahoy Patrick, it's Christmas Island! This painting shows Bikini Atoll with Christmas decorations. Christmas Island is a real place in real life, located many kilometers off the northwest coast of Australia. When the puppeteer falls from the ceiling after Patchy grabs Potty, it's actually a mannequin and not an actual human being. And that definitely makes sense. The audio commentary from the Season 2 DVD states that the cookie dough Patchy made is actually mashed potatoes. Santa Claus at the very end of the Spongebob segment is played by Mike Bell, who also played this fisherman in the Spongebob Squarepants movie. And during the song, when Mr. Krabs sings high notes at the end, Mr. Krabs' usual voice actor, Clancy Brown, does not sing those notes. Instead, D. Bradley Baker, who voices Bubble Bass, sang those notes. This episode is an instant classic. It introduces a lot of cool staples for the series going forward, like 22 minute episodes and Patchy the Pirate, and it does that very well. It also does exactly what a good, timeless Christmas special should do, getting people in the spirit while also being very rewatchable so it'll be just as fun to watch year after year. And man, has this episode aged well. This has always been one of my go-to holiday specials whenever Christmas is approaching. I would always watch it every year on Christmas Eve during the day, and Christmas Day at least once, whether before or after opening presents. This episode is the best Christmas Who episode the show has ever made. There is so much this episode does right, and that is one of the many reasons why this is one of, if not the best holiday special of the whole show, and one of the best episodes of the entire series. Christmas Who is an absolutely classic episode. It is nothing short of awesome, and it's a great Christmas episode to watch every year. The song is absolutely amazing, the characters are so strong, and it introduces the concept of Christmas to Bikini Bottom in an amazing way. Even if the patchy segments are catered towards children, at least they can still be funny to watch, even if they don't add anything to the actual cartoon. And this episode is also the first of so many important things to the series, which just adds to its importance. It's a timeless episode that has aged pretty well, and is still great to watch to this day. But even after going through all that, I still can't remember my first Christmas ever. Even my mom doesn't remember it, so that's just going to make all Christmases in the future even harder to remember.